Hi, I'm Tim Carpenter with Progressive Democrats of America. Thank you, Ed. It's uh, I was lucky enough to be here last year when Ed gave me my assignment to do a uh, workshop up in the bleachers with many of you on single payer. And I have uh, good news. I got even a better assignment, if that's even possible, to introduce our next speaker for you. Uh, many of you know her or met her through the documentary Sicko with Michael Moore. I've had the privilege over the course of the last four years to crisscross this country to organize with her. She's the national leader of the California nurses on the ground to continue the fight for single payer. I think today you're Glenn Beck's worst nightmare. Let's let him know that the single payer movement is alive and well. Let's let Glenn Beck know that we want to honor our troops by bringing them home. This woman understands the importance to call for a redirection of military spending to bring our tax dollars back home to do the work that needs to be done, and that's the work of single-payer health care. Please get on your feet and let's give her a Fighting Bob welcome. Please welcome our champion for single-payer, Donna Smith. Let's welcome her. Health care, not warfare. Health care, not warfare. Health care. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. I have some business to do. Thank you all so much. Thank you. It's so good for me to be back in Wisconsin. You know, I was born and raised just northwest of Chicago. And I spent an awful lot of time in your state when I was uh, growing up, as many of we Chicagoans do. Remember driving through Sheboygan and getting some sausage mitt and mitt out. You know what that means, right? Mitt and mitt out. We spent a lot of summers in Fish Creek in Door County where I learned to uh, the joy of sitting and watching the water of Green Bay and thinking about a better world. And my parents even honeymooned in Eagle River. So our history goes a long way. And now I'm so happy today to be adding to that Wisconsin history of my own. Uh, by being in Madison. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, in Baraboo! At the Salt County Fairgrounds! Yay! <laughs> um, I know today, you know, a lot of us have uh, memories of September 11th for the obvious reasons that we all do as a nation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the page a little bit uh, for you and maybe for myself too, as I always try to do. On September 11, 1976, I was a 21-year-old uh, young bride, gave birth to a beautiful little red-haired baby boy named Russell. I wanted for that child what most moms and dads want for their children in this country. I wanted to make it better for him. I wanted him to have a joyful, peaceful, life with meaningful work and good people around him. I didn't necessarily want a great riches for him, but I wanted him to have the opportunity to do the things that he dreamed of. And always, always, I wanted peace for him. And I look back now on that 34 years, and I wish I could say that at this point, if something happened to me, I would be leaving him with a better situation. I can't say that yet. We can't say that yet. Our generation certainly can't say that yet. I'm 55, I don't know how, how most of you, uh, what range you're in, but I, they tell me that in our age range we start to have more, more of those concerns, probably rightfully so, about what we're gonna leave to our children and our grandchildren. So I thought about it. What bothers me about what I'm not able to, able to leave? Uh, the obvious for me, and you all saw it if you saw Sicko, you saw the story of my family, you saw a hardworking family, you know, we're raised with all the same ethics and work ethics and morals and all the things that many of us are in the Midwest, to work hard, to do the responsible thing, to make, make, things, make things right and, and do your part. We did that. 
we always held health insurance, whether it was through my husband's work or through mine. We always made sure we had health insurance, car insurance, homeowner's insurance, all of the insurances. Midwestern folks valued that protection, thought we did. And yet we saw the same thing all of us have been seeing over the years, this slippage, a rise in the costs of getting that health care insurance and a slippage in what's covered by it. Higher co-pays, higher deductibles, higher out-of-pocket expenses. So very early on in my life, I started to think, this is, this is not working well for me. I had uh, several young kids. I gave birth four times. So I had kids to take care of. My husband suffers, even as tall, slender guy, very athletic and outdoors. He suffers from a, a very bad genetic artery condition throughout his body, not just coronary, but through his uh, other vessels as well. So we had to interact with that healthcare system early on. And we kept seeing this slippage. And we didn't leave things alone. We bought a disability insurance policy because we knew there were gaps and we contributed to a small healthcare savings account. Those are things you don't hear about in Michael Moore's movie because he couldn't tell all of that story. In any case, as the years wore on and costs were rising and still we weren't able to keep up with them, we do what middle-income families train themselves to do. You hang on. You find ways to make do. You go out less. You buy fewer things. You take on extra work. You do what you have to do to hang on, right? Isn't that what we do? But I couldn't hang on, and as you saw in the movie, uh, in a very short amount of time after I was diagnosed with uterine cancer and the cost just kept going higher and higher for our family, pretty soon we could borrow from no one else, we could sell nothing else, we could give up nothing else, and we went bankrupt. We lost everything that we had worked a lifetime to achieve. And think about it, I'm going to shift to our national policy in just a minute, but think about that word bankruptcy, because I know you were ladled with all the ethics and values surrounding that word that I was too. You don't do that in this country. You don't go bankrupt. You do whatever it takes, because bankrupt people, ask yourself what we think, are the people who were irresponsible, the people who bought too much on credit, the people who did things they shouldn't have done financially. I know, because that's where I lived, too. That's what we do to people in this country who suffer health care crisis. We force them into that scarlet B, into that place where we label them forever amen, having failed. They failed. They went bankrupt. That's what happened to me. And I was not in Michael Moore's film because it was a unique story. Quite the contrary. I was in Michael Moore's film because it was not a unique story. And I became one of the blessed people from that film. Many of the people are still suffering terrible trauma, the stories that you saw in that movie. I was blessed to be hired by the most militant, marvelous group of unionists in this country, the California Nurses Association and National Nurses United, <laughs> to travel and to talk about health care and to talk about the nurses' agenda for health care in this country, which is we should have a progressively financed single standard of high quality care for every person in this country, period. I did not want to leave my son Russell, my beautiful red-headed baby boy, a country full of hate crime. And I'm not talking about some oddball minister down in Gainesville. Surely burning the Koran isn't something any of us would like to do anyway. That's just nutty stuff. And we all know that. But let's talk about the hate crimes that are happening right now in this country in health care. Since that day, September 11th, 2001, according to our statistics of 45,000 Americans losing their lives every year simply because they couldn't access appropriate health care. They couldn't access it. This isn't medical error. They just couldn't access it. We've lost 405,000 people. That's a hate crime against ourselves. Let's make it a little more local for you, Wisconsin. Every single day, today included, two Wisconsin families will lose somebody in their family they knew could have been saved. Imagine the horror and the hurt of that. Now we're not talking about bankruptcy. 
We're talking about someone dying because you could you didn't have enough money or the right credit card or the right insurance policy in your pocket. If they're going to say goodbye to Wisconsin families, that adds up to, since September 11th, 2001, 6,570 Wisconsin people who died. That, my friends, is a hate crime against one another. And I, I continue to use the collective we because we are the ones who are going to have to demand that this changes. We don't have the same bottomless pit of money that the other side has, do we? Because we're busy trying to stay alive and support our families and in a recession where it's tough and people don't have work. We're trying to stay alive. We don't have all that cash at our disposal to influence the discussion like they did in Washington through the last health care debate. All we have is our passion and our love and our concern for one another that I promise you is deep enough. I've been in 43 states in the District of Columbia now talking about health care. There are more of us there. There are more of us out here who care and are concerned and don't see it as a threat to provide health care to each and every person in this country. We can make that happen and we need to make it happen. The bill we just passed, we all know its failings, right? We know that uh, for the first time in history, we are going to be mandated to buy health insurance. Now, let me tell you, we all know it, health insurance is not health care. Health insurance is not health care. Health insurance is a defective financial product that's marketed and sold to you and me to protect our health and wealth, which may do neither thing. And yet, for the first time in this nation's history, we are going to be compelled by law to buy it. We have to fight against that together. Because there will be Americans among us who can afford the best of policies, those who can afford the mid-level policies, those who can only afford bare bones, those who will be subsidized by taxpayer dollars to buy some insurance. There will be still a lot of underinsurance, perhaps a growing amount of underinsurance. Premiums are already starting to rise. Costs are starting to rise. The two central things we needed to address, we didn't fix. Access without barriers to care, we didn't fix that. And we didn't fix the cost spiraling. We left, we left the foxes in the hen house. Not only did we leave them there, we invited them in. More. So how do we fix it now? What do we do now? Well, it's going to be hard to do it on a national level. Very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult. And, and, and things change, don't they? Apparently, last year, in a very short amount of time, we found three quarters of a trillion dollars for Wall Street. In just a few days, right? We found that money really quickly. Because that pressure was enough to make people change it. So we need to put that kind of pressure on. But we also need to work in our individual states. You know many states are doing this now. States that are working on single-payer bills in their state legislatures to move forward on this issue because they know they can no longer, first of all, bear the suffering and the death of their people, nor can they bear the budget strain that's passed on to state and local governments. Your roads, your sewers, your schools, does it all have to go into the private coffers for the medical industrial complex? And the answer is no. We can stop that. But we have to work together wherever we can put pressure. Don't just speak to those in your own little silo of influence. Reach out to people you haven't talked to before, neighbors, friends. Talk to your candidates. Pin them down on where they stand on this issue. Don't let them wiggle away from it. And talk to your elected officials about it. I don't much care whether you vote for a Green Party person, a Democrat, or a Republican. I don't care so much about those labels. What I care about is what that person's going to do, do to represent the American people. Now, and I want to conclude because you've got some wonderful speakers coming up this afternoon who are really some of the heroes that I listen to every day and learn from in the progressive um, community in this country who are, are terrific, but I need your help with one thing today. In 1976, when I held that beautiful little Russell in my arms, 
And I promised him, as a 21-year-old woman, that I would give him a better world, a better life than what I had. I haven't gotten there yet. And I want you to help me sing happy birthday to Russell today. He's not here, but it, let that be our start together, commitment to one another going forward from this Bob Fest, that we will be renewed in our energy to build that better world in healthcare for our kids. So if you'll sing with me, I'd be very happy. Here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Russell. Happy birthday to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Let's change it.